and the discussion this evening is the Buddhist community. And if you've not already read the Shingi, do so soon. We're making significant changes to the venues and the timing of the various offerings made by the Tendai Buddhist Institute. These changes have been made after careful thought in reference to what a Buddhist community means. And in particular, what does a Metta Sangha mean? Later in this evening's presentation, I'll be providing information about some of the changes. But first, I wanna do a little bit of background to Buddhist community in general. We're gonna do, I'd like to present a prologue because I wanna say that what we've been exposed to as Sangha is specific to taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And we often don't recognize that what a Sangha has come to mean is something different in the West than it is in Asia, at least in its current usage. And to put a finer point on that, what most people mean by Sangha is really a 20th century interpretation that is colored by the school of Buddhism, what is taking refuge in and the interpretation of a Sangha within that school. Additionally, we've, done, we've all done readings in histories and philosophies that provide us with an interpretation of Sangha based upon a consensus view within the scholarly community in order to simplify a relatively dynamic process. By way of full disclosure, the background I'll be providing is one that is not in depth. I would provide, prefer to spend one or more evenings in that pursuit, but I won't do that this evening. It is a gloss employing a critical perspective. By critical, I mean the social values are influenced and created more by ideological social structure and cultural assumptions than by individual and psychological factors. By way of disclosure, it should be known that I'm a fully committed Tendai Soryo and practitioner, meaning I follow the directives left by Dengyo Daishi Saicho, founder of Tendai Buddhism in Japan, who eschewed Vinaya and advocated for the Bodhisattva precepts that are established in the Brahmajala Sutra, and the, which is the Brahmanet Sutra, which not incidentally were adopted in one form or another by all the Japanese Buddhist schools. <clears throat> the Buddhist Sangha. The term Sangha goes back to the meaning of guilds or societies at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, but it was literally derived from Sangha, meaning that which is struck together well. In the Buddhist literature, it is referred to as the harmonious order to indicate that it was organized to promote peace and harmony among its members. The original Sangha was composed of the five disciples that joined Buddha for his first sermon at Sarnath. Over time, the order grew and specifically referred to male and female renunciants. And specifically, this referred to a group of monks and nuns who lived in a particular geographic boundary and who gathered fortnightly to recite the monastic code. That group had to consist of at least 10 monks or nuns in a central region and five monks or nuns in remote regions. Here I wanna make the point that all of these people were bhikshu and bhikshuni, mendicants. Mendicants devote themselves to performing, performing religious austerities while living by means of provisions given them by lay believers, meaning that is that they were fed and otherwise cared for by the laity who received merit for future lifetimes. Keep in mind that they were also required to maintain the Vinaya precepts, approximately 250 for monks and 350 for nuns. Thus the success of early Buddhism assumed both the desire on the part of certain members of the population to give up normal society or the household life and sufficient goodwill on the part of those remaining in normal society to allow them to do so, that being the lay supporters. Can you hear us, Sam? No, he can't. The, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the laity were the Upasaka and Upasika. 
they were composed of those who took the five lay vows and observed the five Upasata days each month, the 8th, 13th, 14th, 23rd, 29th. And they were also to abstain from eating after midday, witness displays of music and dancing and using perfumes and garlands. That made a total of eight precepts. If a lay person violated the precept, no penalty was imposed, whereas the mendicants were required to observe the precepts and penalties were imposed on those who violated them. Following the first Buddhist council, shortly after Shakyamuni Buddha's death, things began to change considerably. The Vinaya changed with each group in the various schemes. By the second Buddhist council, 100 years later, there were even more changes. And with the Buddhist schisms during the Nikaya period, there were 18 schools that later evolved into two main bodies of Shravakayana and Bodhisattva Yanas. Buddhism had now spread north and west and into the south and began to be exposed to new ideas and adapted philosophically, artistically, and behaviorally. Rather than follow the path of the Shramana, the wandering monks and nuns now settled into monasteries as the rain retreats became more institutionalized, expanding the needs of the wandering ideals became largely a fiction. Large monastic units developed and brought about changes in the structures as well as the... As, excuse me. Um, large monastic units developed and brought about changes in the structures as well as the monastic community itself. And there was a direct contradiction to Shakyamuni Buddha's injunctions. And this is a really rather important point because we picture the Sangha evolving and we are told that, well, especially the Theravada still followed the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. However, that's clearly not the case because by forming the monastic groups and staying in those groups in the particular way they did, they, have, they effectively were not following Shakyamuni Buddha's instructions. But Mahayana had now become the norm in much of Asia. And increasingly the monastic vocation was by no means aesthetic in keeping with the Buddha's insistence on the middle path between asceticism and luxury. An important point here is that there were cultural changes as well as philosophical and disciplinary alterations, which meant that the Bodhisattvayana monks were not dependent upon the laity for their provisions and lay persons began taking on new roles. The lay community became a vital symbiotic part of the ordained community. Nevertheless, the lay community was initially considered autonomous and even distinct from the monastic community. This led to an extension of the role of the lay practitioner. And this distinction between the laity was mostly relegated to how much time one could spend or would spend in practice, and there was still a distinction between the householder and the ordained. It was during this period that the Vimla Kirti Sutra became prominent, extolling the lay person whose discipline and practices were seen as equal to, and in some cases, greater, greater than the Shramana. If you recall from that, from that sutra, it's Shakyamana Buddha who is instructing uh, his disciples who were Shramana to go see Vimla Kirti who seemed to be ill at the time. Prebish writes, and I'll paraphrase slightly here, many Buddhist scholars have pointed out that the basis for Buddhist spiritual life is merit. For lay disciples, this merit could be cultivated in two primary ways. First, they could practice wholesome acts which create attainment of merit or good karma. But additionally, they could establish the monastic Sangha as a special field of merit. They enhance their own spiritual growth while supporting the religious professionals of their faith. In return for their support, the laity received the wise counsel and Dharma instruction for the monastic community. 
While the ordained community followed the Vinaya, which was externally enforced, as mentioned before, for the lay community, ethical conduct was governed by the adherence of the five vows, shila, which means conduct or virtue. The majority of Buddhist membership has always been constituted by the faithful community of Upasaka and Upasika, the men and the women lay folks. In Japan, from the beginning of the ninth century, the role of the laity was further enhanced by the introduction of the bodhisattva vows for Soryo, monks and nuns. Adding here that the laity among Japanese Tendai Buddhists can be delineated between the Danka, people who pay to be members of a particular temple, and then there are those folks who we refer to as Shinja, and these are Danka members who are more devoted and who are engaged in very often rigorous practices. And the Sodai, who are lay members responsible more or less for the temple, rather like a board of directors. Then we have the Buddhist modernist community. Moving right along, I won't spend time on this evolution of Buddhism in both Asia and West because we discussed that at various times. And that brings us to the current, what, I, what is referred to as the globalized postmodern Buddhist community. Anne Gleig writes in her book, American Dharma, that one has to go beyond rationality and discover what comes after it, as indicated by sociocultural signifiers such as postmodern, postcolonial, and postsecular. There are multiple postmodern developments. And what I see that gives me hope is that Gleig references the anthropologist James Taylor. And he says, a re-enchantment, desecularization, and reemergence of religion in Buddhism as a culturally visible and relevant force. Additionally, he states that the concept of the postmodern space is one in which religious forms resist the privatization of religion brought about the dip by the differentiation of the majority through occupied public spaces and the blurring boundaries between religion and secular. Further, she remarks on two features of postmodernity that Mitchell mentions. The first is critical skepticism toward modern narratives of scientific rationalism, universal truth, and human progress. And second, its embrace of diversity in contrast to the modern tendency toward the erasure of differences. And when I talk about a skeptical criticism toward modern narratives of scientific rationalism. What I'm talking about in this case is how many of the Buddhist modernists, as opposed to postmodernists, were really attracted by what they thought of Buddhism as a rational religion, as opposed to a devotional religion. And when we talk about universal truths, it's the idea that there is a single truth which is greater than all others. And this is a bit different than the notion of seeking the nature of reality as opposed to the nature of truth. Truth and reality are really two different, two different critters. Uh, and we, we talk about human progress in the past has always been a way to um, instill colonialism and other, and other uh, measures which have subsumed people as opposed to in, embraced people. And of course, embracing diversity in contrast to the modern tendency toward the erasure of differences. My personal view is that this speaks to what we think of as a new formulation of the Buddhist community. In some important ways, this returns us to the intention of the earliest Buddhist communities in which Shakyamuni Buddha saw the Sangha as a family of people cooperating and working together toward the common good for the benefit of all sentient beings. In conclusion, it is with this in mind that we've been experimenting with different venues, introducing new ideas and new formats, recognizing that the Metta Sangha is following the dictates of Shakyamana Buddha in which he taught those according to people's capacities and abilities in ways that they could best incorporate the Dharma into their own lives. 
And as a shramana, he was not tied to one place, but went to where the people resided, while at the same time providing a secure place for members of the Sangha during time during the rainy season and other times, that would be the time to retreat. Is that not what we're doing with the new schedule? And I wanted to make this relatively short this evening so we'd have time for discussion. And these are the sources. And especially in this case, I use the Foundations of Buddhism by Gethin. And I use the um, article in the Encyclopedia of Buddhism by Prebish on Sangha. And I'm going to unmute everyone now for, okay, what questions do people have? So uh, <clears throat> Gary, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, postmodern, modern, um, for something that many of us were familiar with or are, uh, I, do you consider Musong uh, a modernist or a postmodernist? Actually, I consider Musong a postmodernist. <clears throat> Even though he tries to, couple it with modern physics? Yeah, because when I, you know, I've had long conversations, we, we've known each other personally for quite a while. And I know that he himself follows Nikaya Buddhism. Uh -huh. And so he, while he specifically sees a relationship between the Prajnaparamita Sutras and modern physics, yeah. he doesn't try to apply that to all of Buddhism. That's, I, I would make that the distinction. Good, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes, Joe. Yeah, I think this is this question may be very basic, but uh, I have a question about uh, the three three refugees, right? Uh, Sampo Yamai. So, yes. what, what, what's the difference between, uh, I haven't yet understood the distinction between Community, community, and the Buddha, pre, uh, Buddhist priest, or so, being loyal or taking refuge to the community. In what way that is different from being loyal to or taking refuge to a Buddhist? I don't know, sensei. Well, I, I, and and, and uh, Ichishima sensei may like to answer this also, but I'll give my my take on it first. Um, in the Tibetan schools of Buddhism, one does take refuge to want to the lamas. But in the non-Tibetan Buddhism, one does not take refuge in the lamas. That's one distinction. Another distinction is when you take refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, you're taking refuge to both the, the ordained Sangha as well as the non-ordained or lay Sangha. There, you're not making a distinction which sangha you're making. You're you're taking refuge to. It, they're all. It's it's what they refer to as the four assemblies, and so one is not really except in Tibetan Buddhism. One is not taking refuge to the Lama. Go go ahead, Joe. Yeah. I, I, so today's the topic of today's talk was the Buddhist community, right? So yes, I, I haven't fully understood in what way. The Buddhist community is not just an amalgam, amalgam of individuals. Well, I think I think that part of the confusion rests if you were to go to Thailand, Thailand, and you were to refer to the Sangha. In that case, you're only referring to the renunciants. Okay, you're not referring to the larger. Um, collection of people that we would say the, the four assemblies. If you're in Mahayana Buddhism, then you're taking refuge to the four assemblies as Sangha. It, it, does, that, does that clear it up or maybe I'm not understanding the question entirely? Right. What, what's unique about the community? In other words, I can say that, for example, community is where you can actually see Buddhism in action, for example. Right. That and that's a, and that's a good that's a good definition, I think. But the book by definition of sangha, it means those who have chosen to follow the Buddhist path. Now, there was a distinction made early on in some of the early sutras 
that you had situations, for instance, in which Jains or other spiritual seekers might join a Buddhist Sangha for a period of time, but still remain as part of the Jain Sangha. So they would be present as part of the Buddhist community, but they would be considered part of the Jain Sangha. I don't know if that makes a distinction in that respect. So the, the Buddhist Sangha is specifically the Sangha of people who choose to follow that path, though there may be other people who may still be a part of the proceedings, whatever the events are, but they choose not to follow the Buddhist path. And are they then community? They are community insofar as they are part of the people who are participating. Yes. Okay. Now, are they, are they Sangha in a literal sense? No. That's, that's open to interpretation. Oh. And I think here we have a further distinction because I can look around the Tendai Buddhist Institute Sangha and I can see certain members and you don't know, do they, do they consider themselves Buddhist? They don't consider themselves Buddhist. They may contribute financially, for instance, to the, to the temple, but they themselves may not necessarily see themselves as Buddhist, but they're still part of the Sangha insofar as they, they yeah. participate in the events. You know, it, it, Sensei, do you have any, Ichishima Sensei, do you have anything that you would like to add to that? Well, uh... Sangha is Sangha, a community, uh, the persons who uh, look forward to uh, Buddhist uh, activity, etc. They are called, I think, Sangha. Yes, and Buddha also, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. You see, uh, Buddha is a founder of Buddhism, and the uh, uh, Dharma is his teachings. And Sangha, the persons who follow the teaching of Buddha. This is, uh, I think, uh, basic meaning of uh, Sangha. Is that right? okay? Yep, that's fine. Yep. Yes, Chodin. Uh, and then and then David, because I, uh, and then Maynard had his hand up. So first Chodin, then David, then Maynard. Is there a difference between Sasana and Sangha? The, the term Shasana literally means the path. So it means someone who follows the path. And by that, typically they would be a member of the Sangha, but they don't necessarily have to be Sangha member. You know, it's so that there was there was nothing, there was no term Buddhism until really rather, rather recently, the last couple of hundred years. And that's been as a result of colonialism. But before that, if you refer to someone if someone referred to themselves, well, if someone would say, well, what is your religion? Although that would probably be a silly question in Asia, then you would say Shasana, which would mean I'm a follower of the Buddhist path, literally. Yeah, uh, I think I said David next. Uh, if you mean me, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. I thought you I thought you had your hand up before. Maynard. I may have been it's scratching. Okay. <laughs> Maynard, please. Uh, well, you, you made the point that some people will call themselves Buddhist and other people not. But, of course, that's a Western uh, way of expressing what uh, traditionally in Asia has been simply that you're, you're, you're following the the path or in some in some way you've taken refuge in your right you know taken refuge in the buddha and the dharma and the sangha but uh, then people differ i think with all religions they 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 focus on certain aspects of the bar dharma that resonate with them <clears throat> um you know most obviously you follow the eight eightfold path uh and then in Tendai and elsewhere, you you might it might be a meditation practice where you practice both samatha and, and vipassana meditation. Mm -hmm. The modern twist, I don't think so much as a you, you drew the distinction between a, a devotional practice and a rational practice or scientific or consistent with science. 
I'm not sure that's so much the difference. What I see in catching on in Western uh, Buddhist practice is uh, is a sort of pragmatic sense of of whether you're changing yourself through your practice in a way that uh, not primarily helps you, or maybe it primarily helps you, but in a way that helps others as well. So, for example, if you have a meditative practice, especially if you meditate on just to choose an example, it could could be the paramitas or what have you, but the four Brahma Viharas, you know, you're meditating on loving kindness, you're meditating on compassion, uh, you're meditating uh, on equanimity and uh, appreciative joy. And if those things really, if those values really sink in, and I, I, I'm quick to say that uh, I would not defend myself as somebody in whom those values have, have, have adequately sunk in by any means. But if they sink, sink in, you've really changed yourself in a way that is helpful to others. So I think there's something to the notion. I hate to mention his name because I know you don't approve of him, but Stephen Batchelor he says, you know, a, a Buddhism is something that's a, a lived experience in your life. And, and enlightenment is the way your life changes in a way that, uh, you know, amounts to enlightenment. Now that's heresy, I suppose, from a Tendai point of view, but it's, it's very resonant from a modern point of view. No, well, two things. One of which is I don't disapprove of David Bat of Stephen Batchelor. I, I use his um, um, take on the the Nagarjuna's work as an example. And secondarily, I, I agree with what he said. I mean, you know, I've had conversations with with um, Stephen about some of those things. I got I got caught between Stephen Batchelor and and uh, Bob Thurman. Yeah. <laughs> in at one time, I mean, literally stuck between them as they were arguing over just these very <laughs> issues. So I, I know it very well. We and and um, so I don't disagree with Stephen. What I disagree with Stephen has to do with his notion that all of Buddhism should be secular. And I would say that when you read David McMahon, when you read Anne Glaig and some others, you'll quickly learn that that's what we're doing that's where we're going with postmodern buddhism as opposed to modernist buddhism away from secularization of buddhism and it's because people have a greater need now for mystery and a feeling of expressing the ineffable in a way that they can't through just rational process you know but i don't i don't necessarily disagree with stephen matter of fact i i think stephen's take on the problems with monastic Buddhism is right on. I used to assign those readings to one of my classes, you know, so. Well, well if I could just respond, I mean, I, I do think that uh, that meditation can and should lead hopefully to some, some form of what, for lack of a better term, you might call a mystical experience. And uh, so I don't think it's purely rational, not mysterious, not spiritual. Yeah, but because, but because you're moving your consciousness to to a different level, which otherwise you might have to do with a psychedelic drug. Well, and, uh, you know. Steve, Stephen might have a problem with that. He would may, he might have a problem with the idea that meditation is going to lead you out of rationality. In my conversations with him, well, I don't think a mystical experience has to be irrational. You know, well, he, that's what I'm saying. He might, he might have an, he might take an exception to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions or points? Nobody has a question about the schedule. I'm surprised. Chip, go ahead. Uh, I, I just like to comment on the, you know, uh, Jose, who was with me in at the Sufi community in the in the seventies. And there, there was no, no distinction between whether you were Sufi or, or Buddhist or, or so forth. You were just trying to um, understand and improve your, your worldview. And, and Buddhist path is okay. I mean, I think that, that helps that way. I think it's one of the few paths that are non-theistic. Non uh, and, and 
for that it, it, it stands around but the the purpose of, of Buddhism is to become you know enlightened or, or, or a better person so all these things are are ways to become a better person and I'm not just dis- I'm not disagreeing with that I'm not I'm not in any way implying that there's any other path which is maybe QAnon, but yeah, <laughs> aside right. from something like that, I'm not implying that there's any other path which is not legitimate, not authentic, and not useful. As a matter of fact, I would argue exactly the opposite. I would say that a person who's inspired by Judaism should pursue Judaism, and a person who's inspired by Christianity should be a Christian. And they would find within that community what they're looking for. Now, at, having said that, as a Buddhist, I can still be inspired by a Muslim reading. That doesn't that doesn't exclude me from that. So I'm not I'm not saying in any way. As a matter of fact, I would say the opposite. I would say that the that the Buddhist path is not an exclusionary path. I would say it's very inclusive because you can be a Buddhist and a Jew at the same time. As an example. You know, so I would, I'm not, I wouldn't argue at all that it's exclusivist. And I, so I'm, I'm just using the heuristic device of looking at what is Sangha as a way to better understand the direction that the Buddhist community is going in today, what direction it's going into, and specifically what direction is our Buddhist community going into. What, what direction is that? Up. No. We're always going up. I <laughs> agree. <laughs> <Hi, boy. laughs> Onward. <laughs> yes, Jose. Uh, on this uh, topic of Sangha, I wanted to share um, a moment. Uh, today I was in a training with the Zen Peacemakers International. And at the end of it, the, um, the director said, uh, he says, and take care of yourselves. And more importantly, if you can, take care of somebody else. And to me, that's Sangha. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? No? Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to move on. Be aware that this is the Dharma talk that I gave last Sunday, but I wanted to repeat the message because I think it's important. Many times you've heard me extol the virtues of humility, gratitude, harmony, and service to others. These are called, what I call at least, the four noble virtues. And I'll continue to remind us That's not you or I, that's you and I, until we begin to practice them as part of this precious life. These four virtues are offer potential that is easily overlooked. Each of them has the potential to heal heal one's spirit and bring about a healing for social discourse and behavior. In the last year and a half or so, we have undergone what I refer to as the Great Rift. Several phenomena came together at the same time that pulled apart our lives. We may feel a loss. We may feel personal dissatisfaction. We may have lost a sense of social responsibility or concern for the earth and loving kindness for all sentient beings. And it's easy to point to the pandemic, the rupture in civil political discourse and the associated polarization, a rapid degradation of the livability on our planet and a reckoning of racism and subjugation of the marginalized and social economic inequities. Any one of these would have been disquieting and upsetting. Taken together, they are a storm that has wreaked havoc across our social and psychic lives. The fact is, we can never go back. 
Once experienced, we cannot undo what has been done. In some ways, this is good. In some ways, it's unfortunate. The four noble virtues, humility, gratitude, harmony, and service to others, become even more important now than they were two years ago. With humility, we recognize that what we think we know is not always what is true. It is not merely a matter of questioning. It is a matter of examining and being slow to pass judgment. Additionally, humility requires us not to put ourselves and our needs before another. It is a refutation of the glorified individualism that our society has been experiencing for some time now. And this is perhaps one of the most difficult of the four noble virtues. Gratitude requires us to recognize not only those who have benefited us in some way, such as our parents, we should have gratitude for, at the very least, birthing us. We should have gratitude for all those who have contributed to us positively, positively, such as those whom we love but also those whose actions may have contributed to our well-being in ways that at the time seemed antagonistic, but in retrospect, we realized was for our well-being. Perhaps we were fired from a job that we thought we really wanted, only to find out later that led to a more fulfilling past would they not have occurred had we not been dismissed. Harmony seems to be the least of the virtues that we see around us today. Thinking back to the war against the Vietnamese people that America persecuted, I was on one side of that divide and it seemed like half the nation was on the other. But even at that time, it did not seem as contentious as it feels today. That could be just my perception. Nonetheless, harmony does not mean there are not differences of opinion. Harmony means that we, and by we, I mean everyone, is working toward not only what they think is best for the individual, but what they think is best for all. Service to others is being practiced unequally. Some seem to be giving a lot, while others seem to be giving very little. Service to other benefits the individual doing the service, as much as the person receiving the service. That is something that I think that is often overlooked. Let us begin to consciously incorporate the four noble virtues in ways that see us through this current transitional storm and brings us to equanimity. The storm will lessen over time, hopefully within my lifetime, and a calming will be on the other side. There always is. We don't accomplish anything in this world alone. And whatever happens is the result of the whole tapestry of one's life and the weavings of individual thread, threads from one to another that creates something. Sandra Day O'Connor.